The only thing more horrifying than a pack of grown men brutally gang-raping, pimping, torturing, and mutilating an 11-year-old girl is a modern nation like Great Britain letting them do it over and over again for fear of insulting their culture. How pervasive has the perversion become? Well, here's a map of recent cases of gang rape, mass pedophilia, and sexual exploitation committed by a lot of sick men who seem to have one relevant feature in common. British police are currently probing more than 50 rape gangs, and they shouldn't be hard to find since they're all standing on the back of the fastest growing elephant in the world. The British government spent the last year investigating whether the rape wave has somehow been caused by the race of the rapists. Determined to refute a hypothesis put forward by no one ever, the government concluded there is no simple link between race and child sexual exploitation. Well then, country that gave us Sherlock Holmes, Father Brown, and Miss Marple, if race isn't the cause of our child sexual exploitation epidemic, maybe we can spot another feature held in common by such diverse figures as Abed Muhammad Sadiq of Derby, his partner Muhammad Liaquat, Muhammad Sajid of Rochdale, his partner Muhammad Amin, Muhammad Islam Chowdhury of Telford, his partner Muhammad Ali Sultan, Muhammad Karar of Oxford, and Muhammad Sheikh of London. What could all these Muhammads possibly have in common? The judge said all of you treated the victims as though they were worthless and beyond any respect. One of the factors leading to that was the fact that they were not part of your community or religion. Most British leaders, of course, take it for granted that Islam has nothing to do with these attacks, just as it had nothing to do with the 9-11 attacks, or the 7-7 bombings, or the Madrid train bombings, or the Mumbai massacre, or the Fort Hood massacre, or the Boston Marathon bombing, or the beheading of Lee Rigby, or the deaths of the 270 million people killed in the name of Allah over the past 14 centuries. It's sheer coincidence that so many of these gang rapists and pedophiles share a common religious background, and that with several sets of brothers involved in these cases, the rape wave seems to be a family affair. This band of Muhammads isn't lurking in the shadows. They're inviting family and friends to join them at rape parties, apparently without a clue that what they're doing is wrong. So these men believe that it's perfectly acceptable to rape little girls, provided the little girls aren't Muslims. Now, I'm going to go out on a tautological limb here and say that what these men believe probably has something to do with their beliefs. Let's take a quick look at their beliefs. Chapter 3, verse 110 of the Quran says to Muslims, You are the best of peoples ever raised up for mankind. Muslims are the best people in the world. What about Jews and Christians? Surah 98 verse 6 calls Jews and Christians the worst of creatures. According to Surah 3 verse 32, Allah has no love for unbelievers, people who reject Islam. So, if non-Muslims are the worst of creatures and Allah has no love for us, what's the status of non-Muslim British girls? They're lower than cattle. But these claims in the Quran don't influence Muslims, right? My brothers, remain in your ranks and do not be scared of these filthy kuffar. They are pigs. Allah, they are pigs. Allah says they are worse than cattle. They're worse than cattle. Unfortunately, unbelievers don't always recognize how inferior we are, so Allah sent Muhammad to begin the important task of putting unbelievers in their place, a place of humiliation and degradation, and putting believers in their place, a place of authority and supremacy. Under Muhammad's rule, unbelieving men were either killed or violently subjugated. Unbelieving women who were captured became the sex slaves of Muslim men. Sincere Muslims today look back to the time of Muhammad as the glory days of Islam, the Prophet and his companions marching out and subduing people in the name of Allah. But the Islamic project of subjugating unbelievers wasn't just for the time of Muhammad. If you read the Muslim sources, Islam was to continue expanding until it dominated the entire world. 
Allah even promised this to Muhammad in a vision. Muhammad said, The whole earth has been shown to me, till I saw the east of the east and the west of the west, and I saw that the authority of Islam ruled all that I saw. But these teachings have absolutely no effect on Muslims, right? So we can invade their country and take their wives of war booty. And take their wives of war booty. And take their wives of war booty. The culmination of Islamic supremacy will be on Judgment Day when Allah admits Muslims to a paradise of sensual delights and casts almost everyone else into hell. I say almost everyone else because there's an important twist for those of you who aren't familiar with Islamic eschatology. Christian and Jewish men will go to hell, but according to Muhammad in Sunan Ibn Majah 4337, the wives of these Christian and Jewish men will enter paradise where they will be given to Muslims as sex slaves, in addition to their virgins, of course. The history of Islam, then, from beginning to end, is supposed to go something like this. Muhammad starts giving Muslims the authority they deserve. His followers continue subjugating unbelievers until the entire world is under the authority of Islam. And finally, Allah makes the arrangement permanent. Now, take a look at the world around you. From an Islamic perspective, something is very, very wrong here. Non-Muslim nations have the strongest economies. Non-Muslim nations have the strongest militaries. Muslims are fleeing Islamic countries as fast as they can get visas. Is this what Muhammad said would happen? Of course not. Muslims are superior and the world is supposed to reflect that. But the world just won't cooperate. If you're a Muslim immigrant driving a taxi in the UK, you're taxiing people who are inferior to you. If you're a Muslim serving kebabs to British girls, you're serving kebabs to girls who are supposed to be your sex slaves. Bitterness and resentment grow, and at the end of the day, there are only a few ways you can set the world right, even if briefly. You can start patrolling the streets and enforcing Sharia, screaming orders at all the inferior unbelievers. So Muslim patrol, Muslim patrol, move away from the mosque. I'm calling, obviously, to, to, to not dress like that in Muslim area. It's a Muslim it's area. A Muslim. Or you might go a little further and slaughter an unbeliever, putting the fear of Islam into the entire population. Do you think David Cameron is going to get caught in the street? When we start busting our guns, do you think your politicians are going to die? No, it's going to be the average guy like you and your children. Or you can climb on top of an 11-year-old British girl, degrade her in every possible way, and show her again and again what utter contempt you and your Muslim brothers and your God have for worthless creatures like her, creatures who, according to Allah himself, are only fit to be the sex slaves of Muslims. Across the country, many have been shocked at the uncovered sexual exploitation rings, first in Rochdale, then Rotherham, Derby, and most recently in Oxford. Gangs of men lure vulnerable young girls, some as young as 10, with presents in order to gain their trust. Then they force them to take drugs, rape them, and finally they sell them off into prostitution. The reported gangs are made up of Muslim men, their victims, young white girls. In a sane world, politicians and the media would relentlessly confront any ideology that produces such sickening disdain for some of the most vulnerable people in our society. Leaders would unite in saying, look, if your religion only lets you feel like a man when you're abusing unbelievers, prepare to have your religion mercilessly scrutinized. Instead, they assure us that Islam can't be a problem. After all, most Muslims live perfectly normal lives. While I'm willing to grant that most Muslims live far better lives than their religion commands them to live, this has nothing to do with whether we should criticize Islam. Saying that we shouldn't be concerned about the effects of Muhammad's teachings because most Muslims don't turn to rape or violence is kind of like saying that we shouldn't be concerned about the effects of smoking because most smokers don't get lung cancer, or that we shouldn't be concerned about the effects of drunk driving, because most drunk drivers don't end up killing anyone. A deadly impact on a minority.
is still deadly.